good life. Uh, and we simply chose this title as a takeoff because we believe that the thankful life is the good life. And so that's the whole background uh, of the series. And as we get toward Thanksgiving, can you guys believe that we're almost at Thanksgiving already? What is today, like the 10th, the 10th of November, that we have already gotten that close? Now, I don't know how you guys feel about Thanksgiving, but I feel it's kind of like the Super Bowl for me, so I, I get ready for Thanksgiving. I prepare myself. Uh, I'm doing a little extra conditioning. I've stepped up my cardio a little bit. I'm trying to get ready. Uh, because Thanksgiving is awesome. It is a fantastic holiday. We're reminded to be thankful. Uh, but I love all of the great tra uh, traditions that surround Thanksgiving. And so I have, I've had a chance to talk to some of you guys lately. We had a great small group last night at Southern National. Uh, Angela had the best three shrimp she's ever had in her life. If you were there, you would get that. That was great. And I was asking about Thanksgiving. Well, I love to hear what people do because traditions, there's a lot of similarities, but things vary as well. And so uh, one of the things I think we all share in common is food, right? Do you guys go big for Thanksgiving? I mean, how many of you just like wait for that all year long, okay? I used to have a friend, he was uh, very serious into fitness and done some magazine shoots and stuff like that. And he, uh, from Thanksgiving to the first of the year, he just cast off restraint. I mean, it was over for that th that part. And uh, I do that without the other part the rest of the year. So I just love Thanksgiving. I love what Irma Bombeck said. She said, I come from a family where gravy is considered a beverage. I think me and this lady were related. I've told you before, if I ever go down and I be a gravy, you'll get me right back up. And then Kevin James, one of my favorites, said, Thanksgiving, man, not a good day to be my pants. I'm sure you guys know this, but if you don't, I'm fixing to change your life. How many of you have flex denim? Flex denim jeans, man. When I found those things, I was like, I need to pause for a moment and give the Lord thanks for this. They are wonderful, and they're never any better than at Thanksgiving. Now, I know some of you guys, most of you guys, all of you guys probably have the perfect families. Uh, my, my family's not perfect, and uh, I kind of come from the hood a little bit where I grew up, and uh, we have, and I'm not joking with you, we have some crazy stuff that goes on. It's gotten better the last few years as the grandkids have gotten older. Uh, we used to say that if we made it through a, a holiday gathering without the law being called, it had been successful. That was not a joke. It's gotten better the last few years, but I, I think what Johnny Carson, does anybody remember Johnny Carson? Wave that me you do, okay? Going back a little bit. Johnny Carson said, Thanksgiving is an emotional time. People travel thousands of miles to be with people they only see once a year and then discover that once a year is, is way too often. <laughs> Some of that's true. And I share that with you for a reason. I've learned over the years to approach the holidays a little more lighthearted. They're more fun when you realize that nobody's got a perfect family and it doesn't have to be perfect and to, to those of you out there that are hosts and party throwers, listen, it doesn't have to be perfect for everybody to enjoy it, okay? So lighthearted is better. And when I do this, I find that I'm more thankful during Thanksgiving instead of letting all of the details rob some of that, that, that energy and, and some of that fun. And so another way that we are able to cultivate a Thanksgiving attitude, so let's get into the message today, is uh, by reminding ourselves and thinking about how blessed we are to have this relationship with Jesus. You know, as we go through the year, we all know, we all know that Christians are to live thankful year round. Uh, we all know that we're the most blessed people on earth. We all know that we have the greatest news and, and our God is great. But, you know, sometimes we get in the routine of life and we just kind of, we know we're saved and we know what salvation is, but we just kind of get caught in, in the, the hum of life and we don't give thanks like we should. And this is not a message of condemnation. I'm saying we should simply take this time and reorient ourselves to how wonderful it is to be a child of God. 
And I, I love what the psalmist, uh, David, says in Psalm 103. And I want to read it to you in the message translation. And today we're just going to kind of ponder a little bit, uh, a little bit of remembrance of how blessed we are. So the Eugene Par uh, Peterson paraphrase, the message says, Oh, my soul, bless God. From head to toe, I bless his holy name. Oh, my soul, bless God. And I like this. He says, don't forget a single blessing. He forgives your sins, everyone. He heals your diseases, everyone. He redeems you from hell, saves your life. He crowns you with love and mercy, a paradise crown. He says he wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal, and he renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. Father, we thank you so much today that we can join here at Noah Church. And we thank you for the churches in our city that are uh, pulling together to share the gospel in, in every way possible. And God, we just ask that you would bless our time together. God, as we meditate on the goodness that you bring to our life, Jesus. And God, help us to leave this place. God, with a thankful disposition as we share the good news with the world. God, it really is the good news we're supposed to be sharing. Nobody needs bad news. Help us to share the good news that we have been redeemed and others can find the same salvation that we have. Help us to think about it today. God, and, and shape our trajectory for the week. In Jesus' name, everyone said amen. The thankful life is the good life. So one of the things that caught my attention in this particular verse, these a uh, couple of verses that David shared is the word soul, okay? Uh, the word soul gets used all the time. It gets used for some things that it really doesn't mean and it's not even necessarily easy to define, but basically the soul is the mind, the will, and the emotions. Uh, it's the seat of our heart. It's where we feel. It's where we think. It's where we form our uh, ideologies. It's, it's the core, the essence of who we are. It's, uh, it's the... It's, it's whatever flavor we are. It's, it's the variety of who we are. It's the impact that, that flows from us. And David said, from there, from the core of my being, he says, I want to bless the Lord from my inmost, from my head to my toes. And I think he was simply trying to convey that when you and I start meditating on salvation, it draws out of us this thankfulness, this gratitude, because the the covenant of salvation is so incredible. It kind of brings out our praise from every level. And it's always good to be reminded. You know, the psalmist here said, don't forget a single blessing. You know, as I was preparing for the Thanksgiving season, uh, amen. One of the things I kind of thought about was, you know, do people get tired of hearing some of the, some of the same things? And I read this verse. And I thought, you know what? We should never get to a place where we don't want to be reminded to be thankful. Reminded of the blessings of the Lord. So we are so blessed in our relationship with Jesus that it's the good life. Now, I'm not a list preacher, okay? I'm more of a narrative preacher. I don't even like to preach lists very often. But today, I'm going to break my normal flow of sharing. And I'm going to share with you a list of reasons why we're living the good life, okay? Right out of these verses. The first one is because God forgives all of our sins. Let's be honest. We were all pretty rotten when God called us to the cross, right? Uh, you know, sometimes we don't uh, like to think of it, and sometimes we kind of forget, but uh, none of us were kind of born on the prayer beach. We were all lost, uh, no matter what our background is, and there came a moment in our life, every one of us, where we felt, sensed, understood the nudging of the Holy Spirit, drawing us to a point of total sobriety in the, pre the presence of God, where we had to cover our eyes and cry, holy, holy, holy is the Lord. We realized our sin. We realized how uh, deprived, we were, depraved we really were. We realized that the low place, didn't David say that God, you know, reached down into the miry clay and, and pulled him out? This is where God finds us, okay? This is why this so 
song was so powerful today is because the Lord, we didn't go looking for Him. We didn't know where to look. We, we didn't go seeking Him. We didn't have that from. But when He came seeking us, the Lord found us in a tough spot. He found us in a dark place. And if He never does anything else for us, and He always does and will, but if He does it, friends, you and I are able to stand on Ephesians 1 and 7 today that says, In Him... We have redemption through His blood. Yeah. The forgiveness of our sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace. There's no greater blessing than to know that when I lay down at night and go to sleep tonight, yeah. no matter how good I've been or how poor I've been at this Christian walk, I've been covered by the blood of Jesus yeah. and the grace of God. Yeah. You know what? And we live in such a wonderful country and we're thankful for that. That's why we honor our veterans. But we take so for granted the reality sometimes that we don't realize that there are people in this world that all they have is the comfort and peace of knowing that they've been forgiven in the presence of Jesus Christ. That's all they have. They don't have the peace of a great country. They don't have the love of a great family. They don't have the spiritual structure of a wonderful Christian community like you and I have. What a wonderful thing it is. David understood the depth of this blessing. <laughs> And in Psalm 32, he said, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. We're talking an Old Testament revelation that David had that faith was the way, not words, but faith. And he said, Thank God for the forgiveness of the Lord. So God forgives our sins, which means He pardons us. We're redeemed. God covers our sins, which means He literally covers it and puts it out of our sight. This is the atonement. And God cancels our guilt from our sin and declares that we're justified. So yeah, it's a big deal. And that's why the forgiven life is the good life, okay? Not only does God forgive us, and that would certainly be enough, but God heals us. That's what the Word says. Whatever our sickness is, God heals us. Isaiah wrote of the price that Christ paid. You know, sometimes we, we're praying for healing. We're believing for healing. Sometimes we're struggling because it's not coming the way we want it to or on the time we want it to. And we start to doubt maybe a little bit what the Word says. And Satan starts to whisper in our ear that it's not for us. Or maybe a religious spirit starts trying to tell us, well, you're not living right enough or you're not being good enough, and if you'll dial it up a little. Listen, when that kind of stuff happens, I immediately go back to Isaiah 53. Because it humbles me with the reality that nothing I could ever do could purchase one single day of good health. But that Jesus, Jesus was despised and rejected a man of suffering and familiar with pain. Like one from whom people hide their faces, he was despised. He was held in low esteem. He took up our pain and he bore our suffering. We considered him punished by God, stricken by God and afflicted. And he was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was on him and by his wounds we are healed. When I'm struggling with my healing, I remind myself that nothing I could ever do would qualify me to be healed or to earn me one day of good health. But our Lord and Savior humbled Himself when He had to do nothing and totally chosen and was brutally, brutally beaten and murdered so that you and I could have healing. That's why the psalmist can say everyone. Because there's not a sickness that can escape the atoning power of the blood of Jesus. There's not an infirmity on this earth that can reach outside of the touch of the healing power of Christ. He is the healer. And Jesus, listen, He was not punished for His sins. He was sinless. He is sinless. He was punished for our sins. Forgiveness and healing. First Peter 2 and 24, the Apostle Peter quoted this very verse in Isaiah. And he did that so that the people who don't think God heals in the New Testament would have to ignore that verse. It's in the New Testament. You and I have every right to be thankful today for the healing power of God. Yes. You know, we live in a world of cynicism. We live in post-Christendom in America. 
We live in a world where one in one in four millennials identify as a born again Christian. We live in a world where the church has lost its authority. We used to be the, the center of community. We're no longer all of that. And one of the byproducts of all that that shift from the organized church is the cynicism about the teachings of Christ. And we have a lot of people today, even people who go to church that do not believe that God still heals. They think that's a fairy tale or something that makes a good point in a sermon. But I want to do something today. If you're in this room and God's healed you before and you know He has, I want you to slip your hand up. Now I want you to look around. You know what the old saying is? That a man with an experience is never at the mercy of a man with an argument. Are you hearing what I'm saying? God still heals. No matter what anybody thinks or says. And you and I are living proof. We are those living epistles. This is the good life because God heals us. Not only does He heal, but He redeems our lives. I told you, I just got a list for you today. He redeems our lives from destruction. Now, as believers, we realize that we've been redeemed from heaven, or from heart hell, for heaven, right? It's a from and a for. We've been redeemed from hell and for heaven. We, we I think we get that. That's the salvation message that has been preached for a long time. But you know, friends, we're, we've also been redeemed from death. This second death, this eternal corruption are come, that's coming to those who die lost. Now, I, I, I didn't really want to do this, but I feel like I should. I want to take just a moment and kind of pause the theme of the good life. And I, and I want to remind you in our today that if we die lost, friends, there's a second death. There is an eternal corruption that will corrupt us at mind, soul, and spirit. You know, you are a trying being. You are a spirit that has a soul that lives in a body. This body will perish, but your spirit and your soul will live on eternally somewhere. The who you are, the soul of who you are, and the eternal spirit in you. When God created Adam, He breathed in him a living spirit, which was a deposit of Himself that cannot die. And that spirit is going to live on somewhere. And there is a death on this earth. And then there's a second death for those who stand before the Lord lost. Now I'm deviating, but I want you to understand that if you're in this room and you're not right with Jesus, then you need to make sure you don't leave this building until you are. This is not another joke. But for those of us who have been redeemed, wow, we're not going to stand before the judgment seat. Uh, 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 of God, of the great white throne judgment. We're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. We're going to be judged according to works on this earth, but it's not a salvation judgment. And can you imagine on that day what it's going to be like as we approach the throne of the ancient of days with not one ounce of fear or anxiety or anything in our heart because the peace of God is going to fill our lives, not because we're good enough, but because we've been redeemed from the second death and we stand in the presence of the Lord with total peace. It's going to be everything opposite of how terrifying it's going to be to stand before the throne of God lost and undone. What a great life you and I have, friends. You and I have the good life because we have been redeemed from death. But you know, not only eternal death, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit protects us from death and we don't even realize it was happening. I think the enemy is out to kill us all the time. Hell's got a scheme. That's what Satan does. He comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. That's what he does. Hell's got a scheme and an agenda against our lives. And I think there are so many times that the grace of God and the activity of the angels and the power of the Holy Spirit saves us from death or terrible injury and we never even realized it happened. Isn't that amazing? You know, I've told you this story before and I didn't really plan to tell it, but I feel like I should. Uh, today's just a little bit different for me. This whole list thing's got me messed up a little bit. I remember one time I had been out drinking all night as a teenager. Young man. Stupid, just dumb, just ignorant. Didn't have any Christian background. And uh, I mean, I was, that was bad shit. I was driving home that morning about daylight, if you could call it driving. I had this, 
All right, I was a redneck, I'll just tell you, okay, as if you couldn't tell. I had this really big four-wheel drive truck that had a lift kit and these big mud tires on it, and, you know, I'm driving home, and, and as you got close to my house, there's this huge incline, the highway meant huge incline, and I, and I was in and out, and there was a truck coming at me pulling a boat. They were up early to go fishing, and I was so swerving all over that road, just literally, drunk out of my head, that we crossed lanes. He, he literally came on my side of the road, went off, and I remember coming to and just seeing him hit that side and go through the ditch, and my truck went over, and I came through, and I hit that side, and I went through that ditch, and I come up on the other side, and the next thing I know, I was parked in my, in my yard, in my driveway. And friends, I don't tell you that because I think we should do stupid stuff and hope God, you know, takes care of us. The graveyard's full of people that didn't make it. But I look back and I realize that there's only one reason that I survived that morning. I'm telling you, there's only one. It has nothing to do with chance. It has nothing to do with that other guy being a good driver. And it wasn't because I was a good drunk driver. It is because the Holy Spirit and the angels and God and His power with me having absolutely no knowledge of Him at all yeah. in total darkness reached down and preserved my life. He redeemed me from death and maybe it's so I can stand here and talk to you guys today or maybe it's for something down the road or maybe it's just because of the tender love and mercy of our Savior. But how many times do we pull out and don't realize that we were that close to a wreck or how many times do the reports come back good when they should not have? And God changed things and redeemed us from death. I really believe He does that. And then the psalmist said that God literally crowns our lives with love and tender mercies. So I've thought a lot about this verse. To crown um, means to put on top of all the other stuff, right? So when you guys play checkers, don't you get a crown or something when you get on the other side and have a stack of them or something like that? I was a poker guy, not a checkers guy, but I remember seeing people do that kind of stuff. It's on top of, right? So the crown on top of everything else. So when we start thinking about how good our life is, and we're going, man, I'm saved. He's redeemed me from death. He's healing all my diseases. And on top of all of that, he's giving me this love and these tender mercies. And he's kind of having to pack it on top. I am so blessed, friends, that God has to pack that kind of stuff on the top of all the other stuff that he's already blessed me with. It's kind of like icing on the cake, right? Ice cream on the brownie, caramel on the sundae, chocolate on my peanut butter biscuits in the morning, and then school milk on my lunch table, gravy on my dressing table. There's plenty of negative 
If you and I become specialists in finding the, the, the negative, if we choose to see the dark side of life, we can. But we also can do the opposite of that and we can choose to see the hand of God in every situation, every day. We can see that God renews us. When we should have given out, we find that we didn't. When we shouldn't have made it, we find that we did. When we think we have nothing left, we realize that we do. How many of you have ever felt like you got to the end of the rope, tied a knot in it, slipped through your hands, and you still fell? But you realize God didn't let you go. You know, sometimes we get to a place where we think we just don't have enough strength to make it. I prayed that prayer. I prayed that Elijah prayer. You know, and I'm ashamed to admit it, I prayed that prayer of discouragement in the cave and didn't think I could go another day. But you know, we look back on our Christian journey, all of us do, and we realize even when we were weak and fretting, God's strength lifted us up. Has He ever carried you through something that you don't know how in the world you made it? But by the grace of God. You look back now and you go, you know what, I would never want to go through that again. But I wouldn't trade that for anything on this world because I found him to be the rose of Sharon and the lily of the valley, the bright and the morning star. All those are references to valleys and dark seasons. Sometimes it's when our strength is depleted that we find out that what he said to Paul is true for us, that in our weakness, God's strength is made perfect. See, when He renews us, that doesn't necessarily mean we feel better. It means that He empowers us with strength for the journey and provision for the day. And when I think about my strength being renewed, I think this is a reference to Isaiah 40 and 31, where He talks about how God will give us strength and we will be able to soar like an eagle. And for centuries, the eagle has been a topic of teaching in the Christian church how that an eagle has the ability to use the adverse winds that push other birds down. He has the ability to use them to go higher, to catch them in his wings and go higher in the sky. And it literally becomes the catalyst that carries him to heights that few others soar. He knows how to let the wind's resistance work for him. And you know what? I would love to tell you I do too, but I don't. But I have a God that will do that for me anyway. The, I have a God that strengthened me when all I think I am is weak. Maybe that's what Joseph meant when he said this in Genesis 50 and 20. He looked back on a lifetime of heartache, doubt and confusion. And he stared at the very family members that sold him into slavery. And he could have said, you guys ruined my life. But instead, he said, you intended to harm me. But God intended it for good. Amen. To now accomplish what is being done. The saving of many lives. God renews the strength of those who will commit their life to Him. I don't even have to know He is. I've just got to be committed. This, friends, is the good life. So, surrendering to the Lord it, because He loves us with an unending love. With a perfect plan. And with an eternal promise. And I'm going to close you out by drawing your attention back to the message translation that I started with this morning. The very last part of that verse. As I read this this week, you know, all of my teaching is months ahead prepared. But I go back and I read it again and I go back through it and I change some things when it gets close to time. I was reading this again and, and this, this really gripped my heart, friends. I want you to hear what I'm saying to you. David was talking about all of the blessings we have in the here and the now. We're already saved. We're healed. We're renewed. God's giving us love and tender mercies. And it's almost as if he closed this passage out by calling us toward that great tomorrow. The end. The eternal. The transition. The end of this life. And the beginning of the next. And look what he says. He says, with all the incredible things God does for us in the present, the most important, the most enduring, that unfailing day is the great eternal. He says in verse number five, he wraps you in goodness, beauty eternal, and he renews your youth. You're always young in his presence. One of the things.
things that's always been sobering for me as a pastor, and there's very rarely a Sunday that I don't think about it. How many years? 21 years this year. Every year, I stand and I look out at people just like you, and a year later, somebody's not there. It's just life. It's not anything to be fearful of. It's not morbid. It's just life. And I'm going to tell you that the greatest blessing that I have is to know that no matter what, God's got me. He's got you. If you're here next Sunday or you're not, if you and I are no longer here, you know where we are? We're in the beauty eternal. If we're no longer here, we are young in the presence of the Lord. This is why if we can think about this, we realize we're living the good life. I went over there. I apologize. Would you bow your heads with me? If you're in this room today, and I, and I get it, Sunday morning, most of you guys know the Lord. Not all of you. We did have this on video, the YouTube channel, so we are thinking about that. But if you're here today and you're not a Christian, maybe you, maybe you grew up in church, but you don't know the Lord at all. Or maybe you used to go to church and life's gotten away. Maybe you even once knew the Lord, but you no longer have that relationship connection. If that's you today, regardless of how you term it, born again, converted, salvation, redemption, all those words mean the same thing to me. It means that someone that is lost is now found. If you're in this room today, friends, and you are not where you need to be with God, with Jesus, would you slip your hand up right now with no one looking around? Because we want to pray for you. Thank you for that hand. Thank you for that honesty. Thank you for that hand. Anybody else, we do not want to miss you. Pastor Chris, three, with these three people, anybody else? In the balcony, we don't want to miss you guys. All right, this is what we do. Would you pray with us together as a family? Dear Jesus, I know I'm a sinner, and I believe you're the Son of God who lived a sinless life, died on the cross for me, rose from the dead. Please forgive me of my sins. Help me to live for you as you give me the grace and show me how. In Jesus' name, amen and amen.